Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. It is Thursday, October 22nd. We are rounding the corner as we head towards this election. Just a friendly reminder, feel free to go ahead and vote if you are living in a state with um, early voting, as we do have here in Massachusetts, um, or if you're doing a mail-in ballot, that's certainly important to get in. We really want to encourage you all to get out there to vote. It's a, it's a critical election, as you're all well aware. We are so thrilled to have four phenomenal speakers today in our public health infrastructure session. Um, and Alan will be introducing them shortly, but I just wanted to frame out our, our discussion a little bit, particularly picking up a thread from our conversation earlier this week with a tremendous group of speakers. Um, I think hopefully people recalled the point of the discussion, many, many important points were made, but I think one of the key things that we were thinking about is how intensely politicized this moment and the COVID pandemic has become, what would traditionally be viewed as a somewhat uh, apolitical public health response has become intensely politicized. But we also know in that conversation it was also raised that there has been a consistent underinvestment in public health. And in many ways, this moment provides us with an opportunity to tackle some of these critical issues that are underpinning this pandemic and think about new ways to invest in public health and invest in ways to address some of these broader health issues. And so we're really thrilled to have four incredible speakers with us today to really open up this conversation around public health infrastructure and think about how all of these pieces interface together from government to non-governmental organizations to academics. We all have a role to play. And I think one of the wonderful joys of COVID, if we can say there's any silver lining at all, is the incredibly collaborative nature of many partnerships that we've seen during this time that has been um, really amazing in terms of breaking down silos and building up partnerships. And so we hope that at least that thread will continue as we move forward um, to hopefully see COVID pandemic come to an end at some point. So with that, I will pass it over to Alan. Um, I was just thinking as you were speaking, Ingrid, that I mentioned two aspects of pandemics in our very first lecture. And one was that it reveals the basic social and political fault lines and social inequities and inequalities that are fundamental, but a pandemic really shines the light on them in ways that they're exposed. And certainly we've been talking a lot about that. There's one other thing that I mentioned in that first lecture was the notion of the metaphor of a stress test. And this was a term that was used widely after the Great Recession of 2008 as a way to test the financial institutions, the big banks. If there were changes in the economies, would the banks survive? Would they be over you know, capitalized or would their funds be available if needed? And so there was an exercise known as a stress test to come up with ideas that would test whether the banks were ready for changes in markets. And some people have begun to refer to this epidemic as a stress test. And nowhere has that been seen more clearly than in our institutions of public health, our health systems, and our ability to respond governmentally and through non-governmental entities to the crisis that we've all been dealing with. And today's four speakers all can speak to that question in incredibly informed, thoughtful, and very experienced ways. So we're really pleased to have such an exceptional group of Harvard faculty who have so much experience in these domains and in thinking about disease and epidemics. 
Our first speaker today will be really one of my heroes and a really a mentor to me in many ways, Dr. Howard Coe, who is the Feinberg Professor of the Practice at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And Dr. Coe is one of those people who's gone back and forth between academic teaching, writing, research, and scholarship, and incredible lengths and impressive public service. Um, he was the Secretary for Health um, in the Obama administration, a very senior level appointment that requires Senate confirmation. And um, he worked in that in improving health equity. He worked on problems in the opioid overdose epidemic. And he had really a remarkable level and remarkable portfolio of responsibilities there. He has also been the commissioner of public health in Massachusetts. Um, and he's really one of the remarkable thinkers about our public health system and how it could work better. He has many awards, but the only one I thought I would mention is that he has thrown out the first pitch at Fenway. And I think that probably tells you everything you need to know. Our second speaker is Dr. Mary Bassett, um, who's the director of the Harvard F FXB Center for Health and Human Rights. And I want all of the students in the class to know about this important center, which has really focused a laser beam on the most critical questions of human rights, health equity, and the fundamental inequalities that are exposed by this pandemic. Um, Dr. Bassett spent almost 20 years in Zimbabwe um, doing direct patient care and policy in assisting in responses to HIV and other crucial diseases. And she's been one of the most vocal and determined advocate for health equity. When she returned from Zimbabwe, she became the commissioner of public health for New York City, which is a job that is as big as a job in public health can be. And she worked diligently during her time there to reduce fundamental health inequalities in the city, neighborhood by neighborhood. She has many distinctions as well, but I guess I would say um, one of the ones that's most important to me is that she's an alum of our department of the history of science where she concentrated as an undergraduate. And I'd like to think that that undergraduate training set the foundations for her remarkable career. Our third speaker will be Dr. Margaret Crook, who's a professor of health systems at the Harvard Chan School. Her work centers on how do we improve health systems, especially in lower income countries. She's currently the chair of the Lancet Global Health Commission on high quality health systems. And we not only have to make sure that people have access to care, but they have access to quality care that will really make a difference in addressing the human issues associated with disease and especially pandemic disease. And then our fourth speaker today will be Dr. Raj Punjabi. And Dr. Punjabi has a remarkable personal and professional history. He left Liberia when he was nine years old during a civil war, and he's returned there and to many um, lower income countries to develop strategies for bringing health care to people who otherwise are in rural and displaced areas where they would not receive it. And he has worked on strategies for collaborating through his non-governmental organization, um, Last Mile Health, which he founded and is the CEO um, to develop strategies to work with um, public health officials, health systems to make sure no, no human being is too far from somebody who can 
deliver health services to them. And he's also a physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So as you see, we have really just a great group of people, people who I admire so much. And we'll start with Dr. Ko. Uh, Professor Grant, thank you so much for that very kind introduction and welcome everybody. I'm so delighted to join you today. Uh, I want to start by thanking Professor Brandt and Dr. Katz. Uh, these are two wonderful leaders and they've served up a phenomenal course for you. Boy, I wish I were a student here listening to all the lectures this fall. Uh, you are living through history and to see it through the lens are provided by Professor Brandt and Dr. Katz is a real privilege for you and for us. And I also want to thank my esteemed colleagues on this panel. These are truly incredible public health leaders and I respect them so much and so delighted to join um, Mary, Margaret, and Raj here. So I'm going to spend my opening eight minutes talking about public health infrastructure, especially through emergencies. And I want to start by making this very personal. One thing I love about public health is that it's very personal. And the fact that I'm a public health professional speaking to you is something I never dreamed I would be when I was your age as an undergraduate and pre-med. Back then, I wanted to go to medical school and get my degree and take care of as many patients as possible and cure them all. And I've had the privilege of training in multiple fields and caring for patients for over 30 years, actually. But along the way, early, I saw so much suffering that could have and should have been prevented, starting with tobacco dependence. That's actually how I met Professor Brandt years ago for the first time, because we had that common passion. But when you stop and think about it, so many areas of health need more attention to disease prevention, because after all, our good health is a gift and we need to protect it every day. And as Dr. Katz and Professor Brandt have already alluded, our public health and prevention system is suboptimal and it has led to some of the tremendous suffering we're seeing right now with COVID. Uh, next slide, Yvonne. So let's just start with this very basic slide, what is health and what is public health? I love these two basic definitions from WHO, the World Health Organization, that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. I think about that quote almost every day, and in a time of COVID that's affecting us, not just physically, but mentally and socially, affecting our emotional well-being, we have to think about what is health through a time like this. And then the second, very inspirational quote, the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being. Uh, this very inspirational quote is engraved in six languages on the front of our Harvard Chan School of Public Health and the FXB Center that Dr. Bassett leads. If you come over to our school, you will see this very inspirational quote engraved in the concrete. So these are some of the themes that motivated me as a clinician to start thinking about prevention and then policy and public health. And it led me to two extraordinary government experiences that I just want to describe very quickly on a personal level because I'll be referring to this throughout my presentation into this morning. Next slide. I have many, many memories and photos that I can share with you, but on the left-hand side of this slide are some pictures of when I served as Commissioner of Public Health in Massachusetts, this Commonwealth in 1970, 1997 to 2001, uh, 2003, I'm sorry, and in 2001, 9-11 and anthrax occurred and I was the top health official at the time. So that was my very abrupt introduction to emergencies and emergency pre preparedness. Uh, you, remember, you may remember that at the time there was, first of all, 9-11, as you see depicted on the bottom left, but then also these waves of white powders being sent through the mail that terrified the United States. So I was leading the Massachusetts Department of Public Health at the time, spending a lot of time at the Massachusetts State House, pick, depicted on the top left, and trying to rally a public health response in the state of six and a half million people. Uh, I quickly saw that one of my major jobs was risk communication. And for about six or seven weeks, there were press conferences every day that I was involved in, updating the public about how many white powders were being processed at the state lab, talking about what anthrax was and what preparedness was and how important prevention was. And then over on the right are some memories of my time as Assistant Secretary for Health and Department of Health and Human Services under President Obama. I had the great pleasure of being Assistant Secretary for Health, so serving under Secretary Kathleen Sebelius. 
Uh, when I started in 2009, H1N1 was already on the horizon, the last pandemic the country has faced. So that's how I started my job back then. And then as that calmed down, the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010. And so living through this history was just absolutely life-changing. Over on the top right, by the way, if you get to represent the United States at the World Health Assembly, uh, as I had the great privilege to do, uh, it just is life-changing uh, to serve with President Obama. You can see the uh, picture on the bottom right, uh, a, a, a photo of when he convened his top Asian American leaders to stand behind him as he reinvigorated the White House initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And then in the middle, you see me getting my flu shot there. And this was a way of trying to model the power of prevention. And having leaders serve as role models for prevention is really important, especially at a time like this. Next slide. So you will be hearing the news a lot about the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS. And if you have the pleasure to serve there, as I did, you get to know this 80,000 member department inside out and see how incredibly complex it is and how important it is. This department is one of 17 federal agencies in the executive branch of government, which has over 2 million employees. And HHS at the time tackled issues like H1N1, a flu vaccination, HIV, cancer, tobacco, and then implementing the Affordable Care Act that passed in March of 2010, as I mentioned. Uh, over in the left, I just show you that the Office of the Secretary involved lots of coordinating offices and the one in gray, uh, Office of Assistant Secretary for Health was the one I headed. Uh, a couple offices down there, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, ASPR, is also very important in a time like this. And then over on, on the right are all the HHS agencies that are responsible for providing uh, and reimbursing care and also very importantly, promoting prevention. The CDC is highlighted on the right. That's the main prevention agency for HHS. Uh, but a theme that you'll hear over and over again through this panel and beyond is that our health system is so focused on treatment and care, and that's very, very important, but not very much on prevention. And prevention is traditionally underappreciated and overlooked. So the CDC is very important, but actually a relatively small part of HHS. It's actually the agency right below it, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, that's the largest and most, most well-funded part of HHS. In fact, out of, of a $1.3 trillion budget, it has it is responsible for one trillion. So there's a lot of discussion about how do we restore a better balance between prevention and care through government and beyond in public health. Next slide. And then as commissioner, I did wanna point out that over on the left, uh, we all are studying and working in a state that has 351 cities and towns. So if you drive around the state, as I did for many years as commissioner, each little city and town has a pretty small local health department trying to deal with issues like clean water and restaurant inspections and tobacco control and opioids. And then all of a sudden trying to take care of COVID as well when it, when it hit this country uh, earlier this year. And all of those local health departments uh, have very few people and budgets that are being cut, not enhanced. In a time of COVID on the right, there's been more efforts to try to have regional health officers work together, but we all have to see how that's going in, in a time like this. Next slide. So here's a quick slide showing that after 9-11 and anthrax in 2001, there was this pledge by the country and by Congress and the White House that put more money into public health emergency preparedness and a vow that we would never have a crisis engulf us again and that we would be better prepared and better funded to uh, to address any threat. But you can see over the years per capita funding for public health emergency preparedness has dropped steadily. Now we continue to have threats. We had um, H1N1 in 2009 as you can see here, uh, Ebola in 2014, Zika in 2016. So what the usual, pa usual pattern is is that when a threat comes on the horizon and gets a lot of news, money comes forward, but it isn't sustained and overall the preparedness and prevention funding keeps going down. Next slide. 
And then over on the left, you can see that of the three and a half trillion dollars that our country spends on health every year, only about two to three percent is spent on public health and prevention. Uh, that is grossly uh, underfunded. And over on the right, how much is dedicated per capita across the country varies greatly. Next slide. And so how do we get to this point? We have in COVID a fast pandemic that's being fueled by a slower pandemic of completely preventable conditions. You've all heard that the risk factors for COVID involve conditions like high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, uh, and other conditions. So much of those conditions are preventable, but uh, have been allowed to just grow and set the stage for this terrible fast pandemic that we're all witnessing now. So if we're gonna get through this, I hope we can address these fundamental root causes going forward. And I'm sure Dr. Bassett and others will talk more about how these conditions have particularly affected the communities of color. Next slide. So in my final two slides, uh, I spent a lot of time and energy uh, as a research professor publishing in the medical literature, but in the time of COVID, I've shifted to writing a number of op-eds. So here's one that I think was part of your signed reading. Well, why are we in such a challenge right now? Well, we haven't had a coordinated united plan for the United States at any time through the last nine months and counting. You know, we need not only national standards for controlling outbreaks and reopening society, but we need accountability so that all states are following those standards. That's not occurred yet. Uh, you've heard a lot about challenges with testing, especially for high risk populations. Uh, we've always been behind the curve about having supply meet demand. Uh, we don't have a coordinated system for contact tracing. That's the key to prevention and isolation and quarantine, a coordinated plan for supplying PPE. And of course, we need much more funding from Congress. We had a CARES Act that came through in the springtime of $2.2 trillion, but we're waiting for Congress to send another package, which has to be at least that amount because the suffering is so astonishing right now across the country. And last slide. And here's an op-ed I just published uh, two weeks ago in the Boston Globe, because we're looking at a time where we want a COVID vac vaccine that's gonna be safe, effective, authorized or approved by the FDA, and then embraced by the general public. But what concerns me greatly is that the level of distrust in this response has gotten so high uh, that there are polls saying that even if a safe and effective vaccine is put forward, that people won't take it. And that would be a catastrophe. It would only assure that this pandemic goes on indefinitely. So I propose uh, that what we need to do to make sure that does not happen is to make sure that rigorous scientific standards are part of any COVID-19 vaccination campaign. In fact, today, the FDA has a key outside advisory group meeting to review where we are with all this. So pay attention to the news tonight. Uh, we're in the middle of seasonal flu vaccination right now. We have to make sure that's at a, a major success and prove to the American people that prevention is alive and well in our country. And we got a system that works to protect people. Uh, we need better communication about both vaccination campaigns, flu vaccination right now and a COVID vaccination effort that will hopefully will come sooner than later. Uh, the social media input with respect to disseminating misinformation is becoming very disturbing. We've got to tackle that. And then last but not least, uh, we have to assure that we take a global view on all this. I'm sure that uh, Dr. Crook and Dr. Punjabi in particular will address that theme as well. So thank you so much for these opening comments. Thanks so much, Dr. Ko. That really sets a great foundation for the discussion that will now follow. I guess I would say, one issue that you raised in that last slide is just how crucial it is that the public trust and have confidence in these institutions and the science that they advocate. And so that is a incredibly important issue as we move forward. So let's turn now to Dr. Bassett. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Howard. That's a hard act to follow. And, and thanks, Alan, for your kind uh, introduction. I. Um, as you've heard, I, I did my undergraduate degree in history and science, and that is where I learned that the, um, I, um, so I, I just wanted to acknowledge that it was in history, uh, the Department of History and Science that I learned 
the important intersection between uh, biology and society in affecting the pathway of any pandemic. And I, I'm gonna talk uh, more today about one of the key um, uh, aspects of public health, which is surveillance. And one of the key importance of uh, having data uh, and interpreting them. And I'm going to focus on the issue of structural racism, but I, I do want to endorse uh, what uh, Professor Ko has outlined that we have in this country hugely underinvested in public health compared to other con wealthy countries. We spend proportionally much less. And this proportion has been declining. This is not just for preparedness, this is for the whole public health enterprise. And it's been declining faster at state and local level than at federal level um, with uh, the result that when the federal government basically went missing in action uh, for the response to this pandemic, uh, the states and local jurisdictions, cities uh, were faced with really inadequate resources uh, and a legacy of creaky information systems and uh, uh, that have limited the response. Uh, and one of the key issues was the problem of, um, of data. And I um, was asked to make a brief comment about uh, a group that I work with uh, that stands for the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine uh, that uh, has been working to try and mobilize uh, expertise. This is this august institution that often uh, takes four years to deliberate on anything and was trying to show that in the midst of a pandemic, uh, it could rise to the occasion and uh, made a data available um, through something called the Societal Experts Action Network and tried to provide decision makers with an idea of how to analyze these data because the COVID pandemic uh, arrived with imperfect sources of data. Uh, who people who get to the hospital don't represent everybody who's who are in, who's in the community, and so we went through these data types to try and help decision makers understand how they can use these data, understand their limitations, and make decisions in face of great uncertainty. Um, and this is available for anybody who's interested. We also made additional. Um, uh, recommendations uh, that are aimed at practitioners at the front line. Uh, but what I want to talk about is how this pandemic has, as Alan uh, described, on, on really um, displayed the enduring problem in the United States of its longstanding racial hierarchy and the ways in which um, that this has been displayed and who has gotten sick from COVID-19 and who is dying of it. And the word structural racism is used a great deal these days. I think it's worth taking a moment to uh, describe why this phrase is important um, and it represents an advance over uh, talking about racism simply as an individual prejudice and highlighting the ways in which Racism is historically rooted, embedded not just in one institution, but in many institutions across a whole range of, um, of sectors, and also is reflected in our culture uh, with, um, with the uh, fact that our culture uh, endorses various means that reinforce force, uh, degrading and, um, and, and negative images of particularly people of African descent, all of which go uh, to affect uh, the distribution of resources and consequently um, access to health. Uh, so this is a big mouthful. And what I often use as an example of structural racism is the phenomenon of redlining, uh, a process that um, affected uh, over 200, I think the actual number was 239, um, cities in uh, the United States. Um, it was instituted in the 1930s after the Great Depression. As part of the recovery, uh, there was an interest in accelerating home ownership. Uh, but this redlining 
uh, effectively um, uh, cut out African American communities. I can show you in the next slide. Um, this is New York City. Uh, there are similar maps also for Boston. And redlining derives from the fact that literally the uh, home, um, the office of uh, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, a, a federally associated agency, wrote colored in and in red uh, communities that were considered high risk and should not receive federally subsidized loans. And this set the stage uh, for uh, the absence of access to this important asset, which is responsible for the uh, uh, intergenerational wealth transfer. Uh, I don't know if you saw this figure at the bottom of this slide. Uh, Boston has the biggest black white wealth gap that I've ever seen documented. Um, and this is, you know, following on the phenomenon of redlining and various related policies and practices. In Boston, uh, the median wealth of a white house, uh, household and a study that was done, um, I don't know, close to 10 years ago, but by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, the median wealth of a white household was $247,500. For me, that's basically a house and, uh, and $8 for uh, black families. Um, when it was first published in the Boston Globe, people thought it was a typo um, because the gap was so large. And these, um, you know, ha have been reflected in the way uh, in which COVID-19 mortality patterns are being, um, uh, are, are evolving. Um, it was, uh, it has had an excess uh, mortality impact on communities of color, uh, particularly black, Latino and indigenous peoples, American Indians and Alaska Native. Uh, tens of thousands of people would still be alive today if they had the same mortality rates that we've witnessed in the white American population. And then now I'm gonna show, oh, so um, uh, Howard pointed out the high rate rates of chronic disease um, uh, and how they increase uh, people's risk of, um, of COVID-19. And this is true. Uh, but I would frame as a racist interpretation of the data to attribute the entire excess risk of COVID-19 deaths among populations of color uh, to, the, um, to the fact that there are higher rates of underlying chronic diseases in these populations. But this was exactly the way the, uh, the initial interpretation of these data went. Um, Tony Fauci, who's been totally courageous and honorable and a voice of science in these times, um, pointed out that, uh, you know, we don't really know why African Americans are so sick and have so many other problems. Uh, we should figure this out. Uh, but right now with COVID-19, there's not much that we can do about it except for try and ensure the best possible outcomes by delivering high quality health care. And the, these ideas were um, echoed by Dr. Adams, uh, the secretary, uh, the Surgeon General, who is himself African-American, uh, who both of these arguments are ones that place the vulnerability to COVID-19 in the bodies of, in this case, African-Americans. And similar arguments have been made uh, for um, the Latinx and indigenous populations. So I'm gonna show you some data uh, that have recently been published and, um, and I don't have the reference for that in these slides. They're now, now, it now appears in the peer review literature and based on a slightly updated data set, which will show you what I mean by the importance of looking at data to better understand the ways in which uh, pre-existing uh, pre conditions for the United States, namely structural racism, have worked to uh, frame the uh, mortality impact of COVID-19. Uh, um, these are age-adjusted uh, mortality rates. And in public health, we take age into account for the simple reason 
that our risk of dying goes up as we get older. So if you look at the mortality rate in a bunch of elderly people and compared it to the mortality rate among a, a population that's young, uh, you would expect the mortality rate in the elderly population to be higher. So if these mortality rates were the same, in fact, there's excess mortality occurring in the young population. So age adjustment um, takes care of that. And as you can see here, if, if uh, these are all compared to whites and if they were the same, uh, this number would be one. And instead among African-Americans, uh, it was 3.6 times higher risk of dying of COVID-19 nationally for African-Americans as compared to whites. And they're higher for all people of color, uh, most markedly for Latinos. And the data on uh, American Indians are pretty lousy. But uh, now that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is by looking at age specific mortality rates because uh, you, this is a summary measure and you can lose track of what's happening by in specific age groups. And here you'll see in this sea of numbers, what uh, you should notice is not a single one is uh, close to one, uh, which would be what it would be if, if the mortality were the same uh, among, um, among people of color and uh, white Americans. And in particular, oh, sorry, this is what I offered as plain language for the age adjusted rate. In particular, among African Americans uh, in the age group 35 to 44, um, the uh, rate ratio, meaning the number fold higher, this corresponds to 900% higher um, of, uh, uh, of dying uh, at this young age um, as compared to whites. Uh, and this, these are really, really extreme. Um, I, I don't know whether I put in slides to show you, but for common diseases uh, like um, diabetes, they increase the risk of death by not more than twofold. Um, the, uh, for premature death and uh, uh, that uh, excess exists for African-Americans at about 50%. So talking about a 900% increase in risk is one that really can't be accounted for just by people's bodies. We have to turn to a key part of public health, which is the risk of exposure. Who is getting exposed to COVID-19? Who's still working outside of their home? Who's still living in crowded accommodation? Who's on crowded transport going to work? And this brings me to my final um, uh, slide. Uh, Ibram Kendi is in Boston now, um, and he's written a number of books, uh, but uh, he offered up what I would consider a real litmus test for looking at uh, a questioning whether or not a, uh, an interpretation represents a racist idea. And that's pretty straightforward. Uh, for many, many years, uh, the United States has located uh, the problem of uh, excess mortality among people of color in their bodies, either their genes, a hypothesis that never goes away, um, or in their um, behavior, uh, which uh, is more prevalent uh, contemporarily. And if the ideas are located there, I would encourage all of you to interpret these as racist ideas and ask instead, what is the context in which people have excess risk? It's not the people, it's the conditions of their lives. And I don't, I hope, I, I think I've sort of whizzed through these. So I, I hope I'm leaving time for discussion. Uh, I had three other things that I wanted to say. One, the scariest thing that I ever did as health commissioner in New York City was throw an opening pitch at the Met teams. Uh, so I don't want to be competitive with, uh, with Howard, but um, I don't know how he felt about it, but I was terrified and I did get it over the plate. I, I do want to say that. Uh, I don't know what Dr. Fauci's pitch looked like, but apparently it wasn't, it didn't do that. Um, 
And uh, additionally, you've heard um, uh, in Ingrid um, uh, implore all of you to exercise your uh, right, if you have it, to vote. And I would ask each and every one of you, because this is available whether you're a citizen of the United States or not, to get your flu shot. Uh, that we do have a vaccination for seasonal flu and we definitely need everybody to take advantage of it. Uh, don't think because you're young that you can't get the flu. So with that, I'll stop and uh, say that I'm really looking forward to the conversation with the other panelists and I'll turn my slides off and... Thanks, Dr. Right. Fassett. That was great. I have to say, I knew this was a distinguished panel, but to have two people on a panel who have both thrown out baseballs at major league <laughs> venues is something I didn't really completely anticipate. It's just like any leader in public health, they have to make sure at the end they have a public health message. And the public health message today is vote and get your flu shot. So. We're gonna move on now to Dr. Crook and it's really great to have you here. Thanks so much. And Dr. Crook's work, as I said, has focused on um, quality and access to excellent health systems. Dr. Crook. Thank you so much, Professor Brandt and Dr. Katz and fellow panelists. What an honor to be with you today. And now I have a new aspiration, which is to at some point in my life, throw in an opening pitch somewhere. It may have to be a little league game um, for me, but um, but uh, thanks for, for um, sharing that aim um, with us. Uh, I really, this is a perfect placement really for, for me to talk about high quality and resilient health systems, because what we have heard from Professor Crow is about the importance of both leadership and investment and, and the way that those two things have to come together ahead of crisis. And we've heard from Dr. Bassett that, uh, that our perceptions and our, our, our actual risks come from structures and not just from individuals. And I think those are themes I'll come back to as I think about health systems and health care, perhaps in ways that, uh, that uh, you're not used to thinking about, about it. Um, so, um, I want to just uh, uh, start by saying, what do we mean by a high quality health system? It is definitely a question in our minds right now. Um, I imagine many of you are in very low risk categories. Some of us are older. And as we think about what would be there for me if I got COVID, it's a real, it's a real question on the minds of the entire population of our country. Uh, and one that uh, leaks into our politics and into our, our discussion every day. So. Um, the Lancet Global Health Commission that I had the privilege of co-chairing with Dr. Mohamed Pate and, and 30 uh, wonderful commissioners from 18 countries came up with this definition about what is a high quality health system, <clears throat> which is uh, first and foremost that health systems are for people, not technocrats, not doctors, uh, not uh, public health leaders even, they're for users, for individuals. And then a high quality health system optimizes health in a given context, which means it has to be responsive to context by doing three things, consistently delivering health that improves or maintains or promotes health, generating trust from the population. We heard the word trust already, we'll hear it again. We heard it from Dr. Ko. A health system is not doing its job if it doesn't generate trust. And last, it needs to change when the situation around it changes, when the needs of the population change. So this is a, a new conception that we, uh, that we put forward on what is a high quality health system. And <clears throat> I want to share with you too, these conceptual framework for how do we think about these systems? What are the pieces of it? Um, and well, pieces of it or the inputs to a system are there at the bottom of the screen here where you can see the foundations. We, we need to start off by asking what does the population need and expect from the health system? I think uh, Dr. Bassett uh, would agree that we have had uh, a neglect of the understanding of the needs of populations, subpopulations within the system. We see that in some of the rates of excess mortality within our own country for, for different ethnic subgroups, particular black mothers, for example. So understanding those needs is, is, is how we build the system. And then we need that governance. We need to understand the platforms for care, workforce and tools. But where I really wanna focus us in our discussion today is to come back to the point that systems are what systems do. And here in this framework, um, the processes of care, what happens when people reach out for care? And then what happens to them as a result of that care? That's where we should be measuring. That's where the action is. Um, simply counting the number of doctors and hospitals that we have doesn't convey to us how effectively 
those systems can look after populations. <clears throat> um, and so what did we find in the commission is that systems are uh, greatly underperforming their potential. So this is, uh, uh, these are data from uh, 137 low and middle income countries, which is a very wide swath, I will say. Uh, both middle income countries like Brazil would be in these data as well as, you know, Cote d'Ivoire and Sierra Leone. So it's really broad. But what we, what we found in this analysis is if those systems were able to cure at rates similar to the highest performing health systems in higher income countries, we would have an additional 8.6 million people alive every year. So the lack of good quality care um, is uh, responsible for those 8.6 million deaths. But furthermore, what I want to emphasize in the right part of the slide is that among the, the treatable mortality, so these are deaths that should have been treated or prevented in the health system, among those treatable deaths, more than half now, about 60%, are among people who went to clinic. Now, I want to just emphasize the point. They went to clinic to treat a treatable condition and died nonetheless. These are not pancreatic cancers. This is not even COVID. These are conditions that should be treatable given the technology and knowledge that we have globally today. So quality should be seen, poor quality of health systems should be seen as a clear and present um, uh, barrier to achievement of better population health globally. Um, and we dug in a little bit to understand what actually is the reason behind this, behind this excess mortality. And one of the clues we got is from, comes from observations of clinicians in nationally representative facility surveys where a nurse is standing, typically a nurse, standing in the corner with a, with a, with a checklist um, looking at, at what's going on in the care visit as uh, moms are, or come in with their sick child, as pregnant women come in for antenatal care. And when you look at the proportion of clinical items that get done for these, uh, for these patients, you see that about 40 or 50% of what is the recommended set of medical procedures get done for them. So what isn't done? Um, we found, for example, that only 50% of, of children are weighed when they come into to, to clinic. Uh, we find that over half the mothers leave the visit without having any idea about what is wrong with their child. I mean, these, are, these, these sorts of data really question what's the point of moms or dads or families bringing children into healthcare. Now, uh, each of the dots on this slide is a country, and I welcome, there's a, a citation here uh, at the bottom um, that, uh, that you can learn more about, uh, about what I'm talking about. I want to come back to disparities, because disparities are present in our country, as we just heard, disparities are present throughout the world. And what we did is we looked at quality, poor as it is on average, across income groups in countries where we had data sufficient to be able to, to look at this. The richest populations here are in red, the richest proportion of the population, and the poorest in blue. And for many of the indicators of quality care, for example, having your blood pressure taken during your antenatal care visit, you can see the red dots to the right. So more, more rich people are getting that service than poor people. And this is split by upper middle income countries, lower middle income countries, and the lowest income countries. Um, not for everything, by the way, and there are some conditions in which we don't see many inequities. For example, in low income countries, oral rehydration is actually quite equitable. There aren't big gaps. But this just brings the point that we need to be measuring these inequities in order to see them, in order to be able to do something about them. Um, and I want to come back to the patient and the user, uh, the community member, uh, because ultimately the system only works if it works for them. And so one question that I really like to ask populations when we do surveys with our colleagues in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, here for that matter, in this country, is this question. If you or your child is very sick tomorrow, can you get the healthcare that you need? And I think this really goes to that trust and confidence in the system that I mentioned when I, when I introduced the framework um, and what you're seeing here are actually real data from a real country, and that country is Liberia. So I'm delighted Raj is coming after, uh, after me. But I had the, the really great privilege of working in Liberia uh, on and off over the last decade. And these data come from uh, uh, a time before the Ebola crisis, imagine. And what we found was that fewer than half of Liberians selected in a representative survey felt that their health system had anything to offer them at all if they got sick. Fewer than half of the population thought it was even worth the bother to go to clinic. 
that's a huge castigation of the health system. And it really gets at the question of what's it for and who is it for? I wanna shift a little bit to the notion of resilience. So I've been talking about high quality health systems, health systems that have to generate um, uh, highly competent care, good user experience and translate all of that into better health. But one thing you may or may not have noticed when I briefly showed that framework is that around the framework, there are key values, key attributes that every high quality health system needs to have. And one of those is resilience. Um, I mentioned already that any high quality system needs to be able to change and adapt and respond. And resilience is precisely that adaptation. So in a paper we wrote again with colleagues in Liberia a few years after the Ebola epidemic, we uh, define health system resilience as the capacity of health actors, institutions, and populations to, again, do three things. Be able to prepare for and respond to crises, maintain core functions when a crisis hits, and reorganize if the conditions require it. So I just want to take a minute to explain the, the three elements of resilience here. Um, and in particular, it's perhaps obvious that you need to effectively respond to crisis if you're going to be a high quality resilient system. Um, and the preparation part is what we heard about from Professor Ko. Are we ready? Were we ready? Did we take on any of the lessons of previous crises to really get ourselves in, 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 in good shape for this? And I think uh, the verdict is, is, is actually quite damning on that. And, and especially so in the highly resourced health systems in which we live. It's one thing to say Liberia wasn't ready. It's another thing to say the US couldn't get it together to be ready for this moment. And I feel quite strongly about the lessons we can draw from our colleagues in low income countries. I want to focus on the second point for a moment, which is the maintaining core functions when a crisis hits. And here is the here is the basic point. A health system needs to serve all its users, people with COVID, people who are afraid they might have COVID, but yes, also the huge number of people who have other conditions. That's what we mean by core functions. The core functions are your everyday needs. I was uh, I'm deeply concerned when I saw data, for example, on the ways in which we have neglected care for people with non-COVID conditions uh, over these last six months, including statistics such as a 50% reduction in the diagnosis of new cancers, huge, uh, huge uh, um, gaps in the provision of mental health care. I, I hope that some of you have seen some of the data on opioid mortality, which has dramatically increased, not just as a result of health system failures, although that's part of it, of course, but we also have social distress economic failures uh, that are coming along with it. So core functions are actually critical. If you can't maintain core functions, the population also will lose trust and faith. It's not just about COVID, it's about everything else too. And then lastly, the reorganization if conditions required. And we're seeing some, some, some hopeful signs around the ability to reorganize quickly. I don't think any of us could have anticipated the doctors would suddenly be able to do video visits and be reimbursed for them uh, as quickly as we have seen that happen. So that's a credit to both the uh, providers and also the regulators and governments to be able to do that. I will also just point you to the five elements of a resilient health system. And that system has to know what's going on, be aware, has to be integrated, has to work across sectors and work uh, also with communities, um, has to be adaptive. We've already talked about that has to be self-regulating. And this is about isolating the health threats, um, the COVID patients in separate wards, the, uh, the routine services elsewhere, and has to be diverse uh, being able to address multiple health problems. Um, I want to uh, turn to now, what do we take from, from these data, from, from our work and, and from the experience of COVID? I wanna focus on two areas for improvement as we move forward. One is in measurement. And I really want to call on, on systems, and that's in all countries, to measure what matters and not measure everything that's measurable, and also to measure it when it matters. Um, we called for measurement of functions, not inputs. Um, and for that, you need real-time registries. We need to know who's coming into care. The UK managed to track hospital mortality because they have a common system to be able to manage uh, and, and track who comes in with COVID, how do they do while in hospital, and they were able to put those data together in ways this country has not. Uh, we need to me measure performance in normal times as well as in crisis times. We need to understand what has been the service provision, the quality and the mortality, both for COVID and non-COVID uh, cases uh, uh, throughout this crisis. And we're doing that right now uh, in a collaboration with 15 countries to be able to use their own routine health information systems to know this. And let's not forget something else we have to measure, which is this, people's voice and values. Are people confident? 
Uh, Professor Coe cited research right now about the lack of trust in a potential vaccine. I think we should be asking our people confident that their local public health clinic can do the job if they start to develop symptoms. I don't think people know where to go. I'm not sure I know where to go if I were to develop COVID symptoms. The way that we interact with the population is hugely lacking. It's quite technocratic and not user centered uh, at the moment. And that's not just in low income countries, but certainly um, in high income countries as well. In terms of implications of our work and, and our experience for improvement, one of the temptations in trying to improve faulty health systems is to, is to start fixing what you can see in front of you. And often what you can see in front of you is a provider who doesn't do her job. It's a facility that's underperforming compared to its peers. Um, and so what do you do? Well, you start a project. You might start a QI program in that facility. You might start to oversee them a little more frequently. Um, so you do what we call micro level interventions. What we find in, um, in many countries, and I think now increasingly clearly in our country, is that we actually need structural shifts in the health system, macro level interventions that don't assume the system has to look the way it does today, that really look at foundations of, of, of financing, of provider training, of the way that we deliver services, so platforms for care, how many things after COVID can migrate to, to video chat, right? How many cannot um, as well is an important question. So shifting from micro to macro when we think about improvement and longer term, and this is to, to Dr. Bassett's point about the importance of structures, we have got to stop assuming that it's all about the one bad apple, in this case, the one um, lone individual, um, and think back to what structures created this performance. And in specific, in the low and middle income country setting where I spend most of my time and, and work, uh, we thought there were four big opportunities and I'd be keen to come back in the discussion to hear from US focused colleagues how these might apply here. But in, in our work in the commission, we identify entry points for improvement that tackle these structural issues that start with governing, having a shared understanding of what the system is for, having the top level management and leadership such as that exhibited by Dr. Coe when he was in that position to, to really aim the system in the direction we wanna be heading and track the data to know that we're getting there. Secondly, modernizing education for providers, making sure they know how to work in teams, make sure they understand structural races and making sure they understand user-centered care, rethinking education. Um, third is redesigning service delivery, and that is locating services where they are going to be of most use and most efficiently used by the population and deliver the best health gains. And that may not all be uh, using the systems we have today. And lastly, to really involve the user um, those of you who've heard me speak, and I don't think too many undergrads have, so I will say it again here, health, the health sector is one of the few service industries where uh, we care very little about what users say. Even though we send occasional surveys in this country, that never happens in low and middle income countries. And even here, I think the question is, how are those data really used? So getting the user on board for designing a better system and also feeding back uh, what's not working and what is working is also going to be critical. Uh, so let me stop here, and I'm eager to hear from Dr. Punjabi. Thanks so much, Dr. Crook. This really raises a fundamental question that's at stake in the course is, how do we think about health systems in relationship to public health? And there once was a time that we thought, well, these are health services, this is public health. But how are, in the face of a pandemic do we think about how our hospitals and our service delivery systems relate to fundamental larger public health questions. So I'm very eager to turn to Dr. Punjabi, who I know has thought about that particular question and others, and um, hear his presentation. Well, let me just thank um, all five of the speakers today and Dr. Brandt and, and Dr. Katz for inviting me to speak. I've, I've learned so much from all of you. And I, I just think as an undergraduate, um, it is a privilege to be in this course. I hope you're learning a lot. I'll, I, one of the lessons I hope you'll take from what I'm about to share is the importance of looking beyond our walls, the walls of our campuses, the walls of our hospitals, the walls of our clinics and investing in the people closest to the problems we want to solve. And, and um, that is uh, really one of the things we learned during the, the Ebola epidemic. Uh, there was a little boy named Emil in 2013 who fell sick in the lower part of the forest in Guinea, uh, in the southern part of Guinea, who, with vomiting, fever, and diarrhea. His parents thought this might be a, a normal run-of-the-mill uh, uh, diarrhea. And unfortunately, he died 
And a few days later, his mother would die. And a few days after that, his sisters would die. And this disease would spread from one person to another. And it wasn't until three months later that this world recognized this as Ebola. By then, every minute had counted and months had passed. The virus spread like wildfire across not only Guinea, but into Sierra Leone and into the country I grew up in, Liberia, and have been working with, with my colleagues for now over 15 years. And, and what we found was just that this virus escalated and, and eventually got to our cities. And we were told um, uh, at one point that over a million people could be infected. At that point, there was no vaccine for Ebola and that most of them would die. And in the middle of all that, it was when, when this virus threatened to bring us to our knees, um, it was actually members in the community, uh, community health workers, relatives of patients who stepped up to learn the signs and symptoms of Ebola, to team up with nurses and doctors, to find patients who needed care and get them into care more quickly, to provide social support where that was needed in, in uh, communities that were poor in cities or uh, marginalized otherwise or in rural areas. And together they helped hunt down this virus and help stop the virus in its tracks. It's probably an undertold story about the role of community members in uh, so many epidemics. I first learned about that role in the tuberculosis epidemic in Alaska in the 1950s. We've seen their role in responding to the HIV epidemic. Um, but it is uh, an underrecognized group of people, these community health workers and other forms of community-based strategies, even in this pandemic. Um, we know, for instance, that one of the key challenges in COVID is to achieve rapid and sustained viral suppression. This is borrowed from our colleagues at Resolve to Save Lives, and I've, I've edited it a bit because it, it should be, uh, to add social support when you isolate and, and especially when you quarantine. But this is critical in COVID, and we're seeing in countries and health systems where there is has been deep recognition um, uh, and, and engagement of community-based strategies that uh, these countries are having greater uh, responses and success in the responses uh, than otherwise um, would be possible. And these are coming in countries as diverse as South Africa, where 27,000 community health workers engaged in the HIV and tuberculosis epidemic uh, uh, were quickly engaged to screen about 11 million people. And they are also in some of the poorest countries like Ethiopia and Liberia, where there's a key role these workers are playing. So there are the, the second lesson I hope you take from this is, and, and that we're gathering, is that the best emergency systems are everyday systems that can surge in the times of crisis. The second aspect that's critical, and I think many of my colleagues have talked about this, is that epidemics don't just destroy our immune systems, they can devastate our healthcare systems. We saw that during the Ebola epidemic uh, in Liberia and in, across West Africa, the devastating impact this had on the lives of women, children uh, who were trying to access prenatal care or access malaria treatment. Um, but we're also seeing this projected now. The World Bank estimates that there could be an excess of 36 to 45% in child and maternal deaths in the poorest countries in the world because health workers are overwhelmed, because healthcare systems are um, uh, have to struggle to get PPE to ensure basic services can be provided. And also because, as has been mentioned by colleagues, uh, trust that already was uh, at a low level uh, continues to um, be a challenge and people are afraid to go to hospitals or clinics to get healthcare. Again, here, community-based strategies seem to be relevant and important. Uh, in Liberia, for instance, the government's working to train nurses and community health workers to provide to, in, in, in infection prevention and control, ensuring they have the right PPE, but again, also integrating that at a community level by engaging the community health workers uh, who are now treating half of all rural children across Liberia um, and are sustaining these services during the COVID pandemic itself. Um, this is relevant, this idea that integrating prevention with care, and I think Alan, you just spoke about this quite eloquently, is vital. It isn't epidemic response versus primary health care or public health versus care, health care. Uh, when we integrate these things, especially at times of stress and pandemic, you see lives being saved and equity being more possible. This is very true right here in Massachusetts at the uh, 
uh, peak of the pandemic here, I had a chance to go back to where I had trained as a primary care doctor at, at Mass General Chelsea Healthcare Center. And, you know, social distancing was critical. Mask wearing mandates has been critical in our state. Science-based communication, as Harvard mentioned, has been vital. Uh, but one key factor I think has received less fanfare, and that's the use of community-based strategies for testing, for contact tracing, for social support. In Chelsea, which became the epicenter of uh, the pandemic in the spring, our clinic was flooded with COVID patients um, in April when rates were uh, surging uh, to 3,800 per 100,000 people. It's one of the highest, in fact, in the country. And Chelsea's clinic, but its people and its leadership responded by bringing testing into the community at pop-up pop sites in the town square that worked with the state to hire unemployed residents as contact tracers. And community health workers and community organizations, importantly, organized to provide social support like food aid, quarantine kits, and even shelter for those unable to safely isolate at home. So I think we saw community-driven action helping slow the virus, save lives, and reduce test positivity, and of course, help more safely reopen the economy. And I just point out here in an op-ed that a colleague and I did a, a few weeks ago, um, there is an active opportunity now. In fact, just three hours ago, there was a news story about this bill that uh, Senators Gillibrand and Bennett put forward um, around, uh, it's called the Health Equity and Accountability Act now, but it, at that point it was called the Health Force Act. And the focus here is to provide jobs um, for, uh, for um, Americans from marginalized communities uh, and ensuring that they're employed to be part of providing this kind of public health force that our local health departments, our state health departments have been lacking, have been gutted for so many years, but by again, investing in the people closest to the problem. So I'll, I'll encourage all of you who are um, engaged here to, to look out for this, follow it, and, and, and learn more about it, and engage if you can in, in uh, promoting the idea that if we retrain those unemployed by the pandemic, we could have a better chance at fighting it. I'll end with one last thing. It's just as a resource for you all. I, I've had the privilege of serving as advisor to President Sirleaf, who, um, who was Liberia's president during the Ebola epidemic and is serving as co-chair uh, with Helen Clark, the former prime minister of New Zealand of an independent panel that has been asked to evaluate the World Health Organization's response, as well as um, the way member states, uh, meaning governments, uh, responded to the COVID pandemic. So we have uh, had our second meeting yesterday. Uh, we have our, uh, our report due in May at the World Health Assembly, but there are uh, resources being provided and lessons that are being learned being provided at our website at theindependentpanel.org. So I'll ask um, all of you who wanna just contribute, and actually there's opportunities to do that as well. Lessons, ideas, please, please reach out to us. Thank I hope you I so stopped much. your time limit. <laughs> Perfect, <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Dr. Punjabi. And thank all four of you, what tremendous speakers you all are and so eloquent. And I think um, before we, we have a few minutes to pop in at least one or two questions from our students, but just to briefly summarize, I mean, I think Dr. Koh's slide that focused on the fact that COVID is a fast moving pandemic that's being fueled by a slow pandemic of preventable conditions is such a critical one. And I think we can overlay those, not just that these are chronic medical conditions, but also the condition of structural racism as Dr. Bassett described, and the condition of the lack of uniform quality for health care, health systems as Dr. Crook described. And I think Dr. Panjami brought us home in the sense of providing some ways to move forward, that, that investing in everyday health systems that recognize all of these issues and that are supported by community input and engagement are, is a critical piece of the way forward. So with that in mind, can we pop in a, um, one or two students to ask a few questions, Ivan? 